G. Berkshire's Dividend Policy A number of Berkshire shareholders, including some of my good friends, would like Berkshire to pay a cash dividend. It puzzles them that we relish the dividends we receive from most of the stocks that Berkshire owns, but pay nothing ourselves. So let's examine when dividends do and don't make sense for shareholders. A profitable company can allocate its earnings in various ways, which are not mutually exclusive. A company's management should first examine reinvestment possibilities offered by its current business. Projects to become more efficient, expand territorially, extend and improve product lines, or to otherwise widen the economic moat separating the company from its competitors. I ask the managers of our subsidiaries to unendingly focus on moat widening opportunities, and they find many that make economic sense. But sometimes, our managers misfire. The usual cause of failure is that they start with the answer they want and then work backwards to find a supporting rationale. Of course, the process is subconscious. That's what makes it so dangerous. Your chairman has not been free of this sin. In Berkshire's 1986 annual report, I described how 20 years of management effort and capital improvements in our original textile business were an exercise in futility. I wanted the business to succeed and wished my way into a series of bad decisions. I even bought another New England textile company. But wishing makes dreams come true only in Disney's movies. It's poison in business. Despite such past miscues, our first priority with available funds will always be to examine whether they can be intelligently deployed in our various businesses. Our record $12.1 billion of fixed asset investments and bolt-on acquisitions in 2012 demonstrate that this is a fertile field for capital allocation at Berkshire. And here we have an advantage. Because we operate in so many areas of the economy, we enjoy a range of choices far wider than that open to most corporations. In deciding what we do, we can water the flowers and skip over the weeds. Even after we deploy hefty amounts of capital in our current operations, Berkshire will regularly generate a lot of additional cash. Our next step, therefore, is to search for acquisitions unrelated to our current businesses. Here, our test is simple. Do Charlie and I think we can effect a transaction that is likely to leave our shareholders wealthier on a per share basis than they were prior to the acquisition? I have made plenty of mistakes in acquisitions and will make more. Overall, however, our record is satisfactory, which means that our shareholders are far wealthier today than they would be if the funds we used for acquisitions had instead been devoted to share repurchases or dividends. But to use the standard disclaimer, Past performance is no guarantee of future results. That's particularly true at Berkshire. Because of our present size, making acquisitions that are both meaningful and sensible is now more difficult than it has been during most of our years. Nevertheless, a large deal still offers us possibilities to add materially to per share intrinsic value. BNSF is a case in point. It is not worth considerably more than our carrying value. Had we instead allocated the funds required for this purchase to dividends or repurchases, you and I would have been worse off. Though large transactions of the BNSF kind will be rare, there are still some whales in the ocean. The third use of funds, repurchases, is sensible for a company when its shares sell at a meaningful discount to conservatively calculated intrinsic value. Indeed, disciplined repurchases are the surest way to use funds intelligently. It's hard to go wrong when you're buying dollar bills for 80 cents or less. We explained our criteria for repurchases earlier in section C of this part. And, if the opportunity presents itself, we will buy large quantities of our stock. We originally said we would not pay more than 110% of book value, but that proved unrealistic. Therefore, we increased the limit to 120% in December when a large block became available at about 116% of book value. But never forget, in repurchase decisions, price is all important. Value is destroyed when purchases are made above intrinsic value. The directors and I believe that continuing shareholders are benefited in a meaningful way by purchases up to our 120% limit. And that brings us to dividends. Here, we have to make a few assumptions and use some math. The numbers will require careful reading, but they are essential to understanding the case for and against dividends, so bear with me. 
We'll start by assuming that you and I are equal owners of a business with $2 million of net worth. The business earns 12% on tangible net worth, $240,000, and can reasonably expect to earn the same 12% on reinvested earnings. Furthermore, there are outsiders who wish to buy into our shares at 125% of net worth. Therefore, the value of what we each own is now $1.25 million. You would like to have the two of us shareholders receive one-third of our company's annual earnings and have two-thirds be reinvested. That plan, you feel, will nicely balance your needs for both current income and capital growth. So you suggest that we pay out $80,000 of current earnings and retain $160,000 to increase the future earnings of the business. In the first year, your dividend would be $40,000, and as earnings grew and the one-third payout was maintained, so too would your dividend. In total, dividends and stock value would increase 8% each year, 12% earned on net worth less 4% of net worth paid out. After 10 years, our company would have a net worth of $4,317,850, the original $2 million compounded at 8% and your dividend in the upcoming year would be $86,357. Each of us would have shares worth $2,698,656, 125% of our half of the company's net worth, and we would live happily ever after with dividends and the value of our stock continuing to grow at 8% annually. There is an alternative approach, however, that would leave us even happier. Under this scenario, we would leave all earnings in the company and each sell 3.2% of our shares annually. Since the shares would be sold at 125% of book value, this approach would produce the same $40,000 of cash initially, a sum that would grow annually. Call this option the sell-off approach. Under this sell-off scenario, the net worth of our company increases to 6211696 after 10 years. $2 million compounded at 12%. Because we would be selling shares each year, our percentage ownership would have declined, and after 10 years, we would each own 36.12% of the business. Even so, your share of the net worth of the company at that time would be $2,243,540. And remember, every dollar of net worth attributable to each of us can be sold for $1.25. Therefore, the market value of your remaining shares would be $2,804,425, about 4% greater than the value of your shares if we had followed the dividend approach. Moreover, your annual cash receipts from the sell-off policy would now be running 4% more than you would have received under the dividend scenario. Voila, you would have both more cash to spend annually and more capital value. This calculation, of course, assumes that our hypothetical company can earn an average of 12% annually on net worth, and that its shareholders can sell their shares for an average of 125% of book value. To that point, the S&P 500 earns considerably more than 12% on net worth and sells at a price far above 125% of that net worth. Both assumptions also seem reasonable for Berkshire, though certainly not assured. There also is a possibility that the assumptions will be exceeded. If they are, the argument for the sell-off policy becomes even stronger. Over Berkshire's history, admittedly one that won't come close to being repeated, the sell-off policy would have produced results for shareholders dramatically superior to the dividend policy. Aside from the favorable math, there are two further and important arguments for the sell-off policy. First, Dividends impose a specific cash-out policy upon all shareholders. If, say, 40% of earnings is the policy, those who wish 30% or 50% will be thwarted. Our shareholders cover the waterfront in their desires for cash. It is safe to say, however, that a great many of them, perhaps even most of them, are in a net savings mode and logically should prefer no payment at all. The sell-off alternative, on the other hand, lets each shareholder make his own choice between cash receipts and capital buildup. One shareholder can elect to cash out, say, 60% of annual earnings, while other shareholders elect 20% or nothing at all. Of course, a shareholder in a dividend-paying scenario could turn around and use his dividends to purchase more shares, but he would take a beating in doing so. He would both incur taxes and also pay a 25% premium to get his dividend reinvested. Keep remembering, 
open market purchases of the stock take place at 125% of book value. The second disadvantage of the dividend approach is of equal importance. The tax consequences for all taxpaying shareholders are inferior, usually far inferior, to those under the sell-off program. Under the dividend program, all of the cash received by shareholders each year is taxed, whereas the sell-off program results in tax on only the gain proportion of the cash receipts. Let me end this math exercise, and I can hear you cheering as I put away the dentist drill, by using my own case to illustrate how a shareholder's regular disposals of shares can be accompanied by an increased investment in his or her business. For the last seven years, I have annually given away about 4.25% of my Berkshire shares. Through this process, my original position of 712,497,000 B equivalent shares split adjusted has decreased to 528,525,623 shares. Clearly, my ownership percentage of the company has significantly decreased, yet my investment in the business has actually increased. The book value of my current interest in Berkshire considerably exceeds the book value attributable to my holdings of seven years ago. The actual figures are 28.2 billion for 2005 and 40.2 billion for 2012. In other words, I now have far more money working for me at Berkshire, even though my ownership of the company has materially decreased. Berkshire truly has an owner base unlike any other giant corporation. That fact was demonstrated in spades at last year's annual meeting, where the shareholders were offered a proxy resolution, resolved. Whereas the corporation has more money than it needs, and since owners unlike Warren are not multi-billionaires, the board shall consider paying a meaningful annual dividend on the shares. The sponsoring shareholder of that resolution never showed up at the meeting, so his motion was not officially proposed. Nevertheless, the proxy vote had been tallied, and they were enlightening. Not surprisingly, the A shares, owned by relatively few shareholders, each with a large economic interest, voted no on the dividend question by a margin of 89 to 1. The remarkable vote was that of our B shares. They number in the hundreds of thousands, perhaps even totaling 1 million, and they voted 660,759,855 no and 13,927,026 yes a ratio of about 47 to 1. Our directors recommended a no vote, but the company did not otherwise attempt to influence shareholders. Nevertheless, 98% of the shares voting said, in effect, don't send us a dividend, but instead reinvest all of the earnings. To have our fellow owners, large and small, be so in sync with our managerial philosophy is both remarkable and rewarding.